The Football Show on Off The Ball. With Sky. Watch every live Premier League game this season on Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. I'm prepared to end it and I can't. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <gasps> Why should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. It is Thursday's football show. Nathan with you this evening. I am delighted to be joined in the studio by Stephen McGuinness, who is the General Secretary at the Professional Footballers Association of Ireland, the PFAI. Uh, good to see you, Stephen. Good to see you, Nathan. How are things? Uh, so it's been a big week for the PFAI. You had an announcement earlier in the week that the Players' Union and the FAI's National League Committee and the representative bodies acting on behalf of the clubs in each division reached a deal to secure a minimum wage for senior professionals. This is the first time this is going to come in across the League of Ireland. So senior professional players in the League of Ireland over the age of 20 will be entitled to a minimum wage of €430 Euro per week from next season. Uh, the payment will start from the first week of pre-season up until the end of November. Part-time professional players will be €130 Euro a week uh, and it depends then on age where 16 and 17 year olds would get 280, 18 year olds 330, 19 year olds 380 euro a week. This is something I know that's been worked on in the background for a long, long time. Uh, how involved have the clubs been in this? And yeah. how has it gone down with the clubs? Yeah, I, I suppose, uh, first of all, we had met uh, on the 18th of April, so it's way back. Uh, we met with the NLC, as you said, uh, that have representatives from the Premier Division, representatives from the Force Division, and represent, re- representatives from the women's game. Um, so we had presented to them um, some of the numbers that you had said there, and, and obviously we went through with them. What we felt uh, was reasonable from a, from a player's perspective, we had done a huge body of work uh, in the off-season last season with the players trying to analyse how many hours they do, analysing all the aspects of being an elite professional footballer so um, what then happened was in our, in our naivety we thought the NLC was actually a body who represents that, that group represents the clubs we actually found out at the end of the meeting they actually don't they are a voice for it but that the PCA which is the Premier Clubs uh, Association and the Force Division Alliance are actually the groups which are all the members so that prolonged all the discussions because they had to keep going back to obviously a bigger group of of, uh, of, of clubs and that we need a few more committees really yeah we need a few more committees but I suppose the one thing and there was some comment on this that I'd seen on social media was that some of the bigger clubs had driven this or you know that actually wasn't the case everybody had a, had a, had a, had a piece to say about this thing and it did take a long time I was f- frustrated a number of times with how long it had took but um, look at the end of the day it, it's got to where it's got to we would be um, bitterly disappointed with the with the the wage for a part time professional player of one hundred and thirty euros. I think that's that is on the level of exploitation in in our opinion. Um, so it's work to do, Nathan, from our perspective, to have a look next season at exactly now in that arena how many hours are actually them players doing particularly with new teams coming into the first division this year there's a hell of a lot of travel in that division and the expectation uh, of players at 20 years of age and above on 130 euros that's something that we're going to look at so there's a lot in this uh, in terms of professional and part-time, in terms of the various resources available at different clubs at the top of the Premier Division compared to the bottom of the First Division. Uh, give us a sense of the €430 Euro per week for professional players over the age of 20. What percentage of players currently earn less than that? Yeah, these figures aren't out there, right? Because the FEI don't give you... The, our, contra- our contracts... Don't um, there isn't an analysis done on them and the figures thrown out there. Anecdotally, we know what's going on in the league because I mean I've gone to every single dressing room in the country. We've spoken to all the players, so anecdotally we know that there's a significant the number of players that are paid us. The exact numbers we don't know um, because that information isn't isn't out there. We're not going to, I suppose. As a players' association, can you not demand from the clubs uh, to know the salaries that every player uh, is on? Uh, just so, just you know, there's no. Our clubs, when when you see Nathan, how long it's taken for us to get to to get to the point that we're at to try and get that tease that information out of people is quite difficult. Sitting a bit closer to the mic, they're actually yes, yeah, even yeah. <laughs> is that it's quite difficult to get that level of information. But we know that um, from from being around the dressing rooms, that is a significant amount of players who are on uh, less than the four thirty that we've got. I think it's important as well for the listeners to know as well that when we we actually look for four twenty 
was what we looked for. The clubs actually came back with a higher amount for the full time. So, so, so how was that worked out? How was the four hundred and thirty euro per week? Yeah. So, so what, so what we were looking at was the minimum wage, obviously in the country. We looked mm-hmm. at what what the minimum wage was in the country, and we felt that four hundred and twenty euros reflects sort of um, the work that an individual would do in the professional arena as a minimum wage. And the clubs looked at it and came back and said, actually, we actually think it should be slightly higher, and we're happy with four hundred and thirty euros. And the part-time side of things, it was a little bit more difficult. We worked out that it's 18.02 hours is what players were doing, and we multiplied that by the minimum wage, and that's where we came up with the 190. So so that was the first division one was done, or sorry, the part-time one was done on hours, and the, the Premier Division was done on salary. What's classified as work for a footballer? Yeah, and, and this is, the, this is the, again, the question that, that keeps coming up. Um, it, it's, it's felt that, and there's loads of little terms on this, like, is it when they arrive at the training ground? Is it when they actually go on the field to play? Is it, uh, where, where does recovery, where does rest come into this? So the salary element, that was what we wanted. And to be honest, in the first division, we wanted a salary as well. But when we started to, to look at it and started to debate it, people would start questioning hours. So then we, for part-time professionals, we started looking at digging into the hours. And that's where we come up with the 190. Is it right that the minimum wage is the same for Premier Division clubs and First Division clubs, um, considering the difference in revenue by and large, even from the difference from the top Premier Division clubs to the bottom yeah. Premier Division? I clubs? suppose if you look in the in the Premier Division um, at the moment, um, there is eight. Or sorry, next season there will be for for sure eight full time professional teams, potentially uh, two part times, which would be drawn at New CD. And depending on the result uh, on Friday, if Waterford were to be promoted, we would only have currently Drogheda United as the only part time team. So that argument is not there in the Premier Division so there's only one team that could potentially be part of everybody else is full time so it's a level playing field bar one team <laughs> who have already said by the way who, who, have, who the chairman has come out looking for investment saying they will not stay mm. up unless they go full time yeah so that's Drogheda that's right the professional and part time uh, I often find confusing when you talk to players who are part time part time would imply that you could have a job elsewhere or a lot of them are students I imagine who are mm. part time uh, how many hours a week are part time professionals allowed work before they be classified as full time professionals yeah and again th- this is this is a very difficult thing to work out because what the hours that a guy can work because it's f- professional football you can only do a certain amount of hours mm. <laughs> like, so a part time what, what we actually when we done our analysis what we found out was the part time player spending more time on the pitch than the full time player because the part-time player doesn't have the resources that the full-time has. So all the analysis stuff has been done on the pitch. Um, the, the strength and condition stuff has been done on the pitch. Well, the full-time player is able to have, they have gyms, they have uh, analysis rooms. Mm. So it's completely different. So, so from that perspective, there, is not, um, th- there isn't any difference between the boating from the errors that they do. It's just that one has this period of time to be able to rest and recover. And the, full, and the part-time player doesn't have that. Would you be concerned that because there's such a difference in the weekly wage between professional and part-time that we'll actually see a lot more part-time players, albeit they'll almost be doing full-time hours? Yeah. It's something that we've got to keep our, keep our eye on, Nathan. I have to be honest, it's something that we're aware of. We've looked at all the scenarios where the clubs can, can, can try, and I hope they don't, but they can try and get around this. Mm. So um, we, will be, we will be on top of it as much as we possibly can from because our office minimum wage, even the minimum wage of, uh, for anybody who's out working isn't from day one. There's training involved. After six months, that can change. After a year, that can change. Yeah. So for anybody who is a full-time professional, who signs a full-time professional contract, are they guaranteed 430 euro per week from the off? They are. There, there is other, other elements in it. Nathan, as you said, it's quite an extensive enough document. If the player is getting uh, is, is accommodations being paid, that can drop by another 100. If he's getting educated at degree level, that can drop by 100 again. So so if these are factored in, because what we're trying to do, we're trying to encourage clubs as well to make links with universities, trying to build in education into this as well. So so elements of this um, can, can ensure that if the clubs are investing into the player, that there's something in it for them as well. I know you say you don't know exactly the wages that every player is on, but surely you must have taken into account the impact this would have on a lot of clubs. I'd imagine this is going to substantially increase the wage bill at a lot of clubs. Isn't it terrible, Nathan, that we're talking about, right, this this increase in the wage bill when we're talking about the minimum? 
I, I like, absolutely like, understand like, that. And like, I think everybody would say that 430 euro <laughs> is not a lot of money no. in uh, a cost of living crisis, that it is the bare minimum. Yeah. But also, the eco financial ecosystem around the League of Ireland is a complete basket case compared to every other league. There is no financial revenue from television rights whatsoever. Correct. Correct. It's incredibly difficult for clubs to bring in extra revenue. So I'm sure like it is a meritocracy after all that yeah. you know, generally the higher the wage bill, the more successful you're going to be. Clubs would like to have better players, but they simply can't afford to pay, pay them. Yeah, but we have to have, we can't have exploitation in a league like this. So what we've got to have is we have to get the, the base in first. So let's get the minimum wage in. Yes, it may affect up the ladder. It may affect the top players, may have to get paid a little bit less. Um, but there has to be fairness here. And that's all we're looking for. All we're looking for is fairness, and we're not. We're looking for players not to be exploited, and for the minimum wage. And by the way, all we're talking about is is the law here. <laughs> I'm not talking about bringing mm. in something that's beyond that. We're talking about bringing in uh, the law around holiday pay, which was a huge issue for us for years, when no player was paid holiday pay. We had issues with players not getting paid in pre-season, been paid half week, all this type of stuff. That's now being cleared up, and it's a hugely positive step. And there has been, as I have seen, not one club that I'm aware of has come out and criticised it. Not one. Um, I haven't said not publicly as of yet. Well, uh, well, and, I would encourage a club to come out and say and say give me give a reason publicly of why they don't think the minimum wage is the right thing to do. Are there potentially issues for clubs? And uh, again, there's not many clubs in this position who have signed long-term contracts with players who have a wage bill and they have players on substantial wages who now have to increase their overall wage bill to bring other players at the lower end into this. Mm. That could put them in financial difficulty. No, is the answer. No, because what we have is the only clubs who are offering um, big long-term deals are our top clubs. And our top clubs don't have an issue with this. Like, don't forget, and just go back to the point I made to you earlier, Nathan, the Premier Division clubs raise the minimum wage. You don't raise the minimum wage if you can't afford it. Mm. So, our, so the Premier Division clubs raised the minimum wage that we looked for from 4.20 to 4.30. So that meant that when they looked at their finances, which they have, have uh, had over eight months to do, um, they, like, don't forget, this started in April. People think we just started negotiating last week. No, we didn't. Um, so from that side of things, there is no issue. And then when you go into the first division, there ain't nobody on two-year deals in the first division. So we're not that issue that you've brought up there is not an issue in this league. Uh, you are the player's representative body, so I have to assume you have a mandate uh, to go and chase this because uh, was there any questions raised about those players, from those players at the top clubs who are earning significantly more than this as to the fact, as you say, it may it may mean those players have to take a bit of a cut if clubs are to stay yeah, It depends, I, I, I suppose. Like, when you, yeah, when you see, like, like we, we had a, obviously a players group who worked on this, so it was Roberto Lopez, it was uh, Brendan Clark, it was Lee Station, Andy Lyons. Roberto Lopez was one of the best players in the league and it, this doesn't this won't affect Roberto Lopez it doesn't affect Andy Lyons it doesn't affect Brendan Clark they're doing it because it's the right thing to do they they want a league where everybody is treated properly and that's ultimately why we've got to where we've got to and I, I think you see the power of the players I, I know Andy done an interview there earlier where um, when he sat in front of the FAI when a player is speaking it's far more powerful than, than the association because this is the guys who it affects like, and Andy was that player Like I've, I've messages for the last three days from players who are now playing in England saying I wish I was on 4.30 when I was 20 in the League of Ireland because they weren't like, and mm. I, I go to the likes of Danny Mandrill and guys like that who weren't getting paid 430 when they were 19, 20 years of age so it's a huge step forward it, it's a it, it's it's a game changer in relation to to where relationships need to get to it as well because I think there's an understanding from both like we, we we have we have there's parts of this deal that the details of it we can go into but where we've we've conceded on certain things to make it better for the clubs. What did you concede on? So on um on the domestic training compensation model currently a, a club must um pay a player um when his contract's up to retain the rights for compensation for him, they must keep paying him. Right? So the player can allow that to go on for as long as he wants, right? Without having to sign the contract. So for example, Andy Lyons last year with Bohemians could have gone on trials to England, he could have gone to Shamrock Rovers, trained with them and all the rest, and both had to keep paying him for have the rights for compensation. Right. What we've conceded on that is we have said, Do you know what? That isn't actually fair and it's actually not right. So what we've said is now the players must make a decision by November thirtieth on what club he's gonna is he going to re-sign for that club as retention or is he going to move to another club? So what that does now is it leaves the club now making its decisions better and earlier. And so there is concessions from our perspective. We also had to concede on the 190 we looked for, mm. it ended up at 130. So there is concessions there. I'm not happy with the 130, but there is concessions. I'm sorry, who was pushing for the 130? 
I would say there's a, a cohort of clubs in the first division who want the league to go backwards. Right? They they have no intention of pushing this league forward. They want to to they want the issue, Nathan, is they want control of the players because our, the option for them, if it was one, is to turn the player into an amateur. There's no problem. Like you have an amateur player, you pay him expenses, that's fine. But the clubs want the control of being able to retain the players for next season, so they'd be able to get a transfer fee for them. But surely that needs the FAI in that s- scenario to come in and say actually this is going to be a part of the licensing agreement we all agree 190 euro even for an amateur player mm. it will barely cover uh, your rent and never mind anything else yeah, you're that, that those convert- players shouldn't talk- be that yeah. those teams shouldn't be given any sort of power yeah. uh, and the, the problem there Nathan is if you go too high on it right and you go 190 then everybody turns amateur and now you're back into a cash culture so there's a balance there but in that scenario don't you need to say if you're turning amateur you can't play in the league of ireland sorry now you're speaking my language because I don't think in the League of Ireland in this again personal opinion I don't think amateur teams should be in the League of Ireland that's my personal opinion but are there um, amateur players playing in the League of Ireland there's loads of them there, there, there's loads and of them there's, I tell you there's, there's an amateur player going to play in the cup final what do you mean by amateur as in he hasn't, he's not a professional he's not on a professional so he doesn't contract. receive any no, payment receive no at all yeah, no but is that his choice um, it wasn't his choice it wasn't his choice because at the moment, and this is something that, that right, was and it's two, it, 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 it's it's two Shelburne against Derry City playing in the, in the League gotcha. of Ireland. Gotcha. So we're talking about two of the biggest clubs in the country. So a player is going to play in the cup final who isn't being paid. Correct. That's insane. This is the League of Ireland. But surely that player is making that decision himself. I would say that that player has made that decision in in the last couple of weeks. I'd say, yeah. I say the club. I, I would say. The club has. So has is this a scenario where the player was previously being paid, their contract was up, and he no. had the choice of leaving no, or no. staying for the cup no. final? No. no. What this would be is, like in a lot of clubs around the country, it would be a young player coming through the ranks and and being an amateur all the way, and then breaks into the first team or is in around the first team, and then they go, oh, now we want to offer you something. So he wasn't on something earlier, right? And and the way I would like to see this this work would be that after a certain amount against it's part of our discussions the FAI which was there's other parts of that would knock back sorry just, just because I, like this I think people are going to find this fascinating that somebody could play in such a high profile game mm. uh, I'm going to assume it's a Shelburne player because well, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say okay. what, well, what the Derry, Derry City are I obviously owned by a billionaire I don't think it's fair well, to, to name sorry, anybody it's just, either a Shelburne player or a Derry City player correct yeah. Is it is is it a case that this player has backed themselves and has said I'm going to stay amateur and not sign a professional contract? So if I go on a man of the match in the cup final, I can sign for whoever I want in a week's time on a good wage. No, it doesn't really matter to be honest with you whether he's amateur or pro because there's still compensation, Joan. So it makes actually actually no difference. So he's, there's going to be compensation on him either way. So the, if he signs a contract. Well then, um, the club have control, obviously. If they don't, they're still trying to compensate you. Do you want him up to a quarter of a million euros? So. so. I have to say I'm a bit shocked by that. I would have thought maybe at the the lower rung of the first division mm. that would be the situation. Mm. And would there be many players playing in the Premier Division over the past year who'd be amateur? Yeah, there, there would be some. Uh, some of the younger guys coming through um, would be amateurs, and um, that it, it can happen. That's for sure. Well, you'll always have a you know academy player yeah. who's 16, 17 yeah. who gets thrown in. Uh, yeah, it's funny that because I was looking the other day because obviously I'm aware of the situation around clubs and it's 1960. I think it's 1965 since the last amateur played in in uh, the Premier League in England. So it tells you mm. like, and we've amateur players playing in the Premier Division of the League of Ireland but what we would like to see Nathan is after a certain period of games the player has to become a professional you have to make him a professional on that minimum salary exactly but there, there's a resistance from the clubs to that right? a, a huge resistance from the clubs and we're, we're conceding here that we're going to give away the players rights to make that decision we're saying you automatically become a professional at that and th- these discussions like I see the benefits from it. The clubs are sort of looking. Oh, I can see. What, in one hand, it's good, but in another hand, it's bad. So, um, so these are these are discussions that were that were having at the moment. I would like to see an in the minimum of the pros as well at every club. Uh, I see some club presidents uh, tweeting there the other day about you know their disappointment that a union and I was dictating to them how many professional players they have. Well, do you know what the FAO dictate to you what the what the qualifications of your manager is, how many seats you have in your ground. So I actually think the league should be if we want to grow a league here. If you want to play in the Premier League right now, Nathan, you can walk in with an amateur team into our Premier Division. And we've had an amateur team in our Premier Division not that long ago. Wexford were in the Premier Division mm. not that long ago, completely amateur. So if we're trying to build a professional league, there has to be parameters in there. And in my opinion, to play in the Premier Division, it should be 16 full-time professional players. That's what you should have. Or otherwise you can't get in. And just on those amateur players then in the first division in terms of percentage, because yeah. some players want to be amateur and they you know, they have successful careers outside of football and they don't want that 
full commitment and they want to be able to step away when they want to step away of are the vast majority of players who would prefer to be either part-time or full-time professionals? I think when you uh, end the quorum was, was at our um, launch uh, yes, or on Tuesday and he spoke about the next move for treaty and the next move for treaty is to be professional like, that's the next move every single player in Nathan that plays in the League of Ireland wants to be a professional I don't. I have never met anybody who doesn't want to be a professional footballer they want to be professional um, and, and things you made some great points out around it we all know this no TV deal you know revenue streams aren't what they want to be the investment from government the investment from the FAO in the league and I, and I get all that um, but at the end of the day, every player wants to be a professional footballer and all we've done in the last couple of days is give them a platform to start from I- the other thing that often comes up when it comes to players' contracts is the 52 weeks of the year. Yeah. Uh, and you know, teams almost delaying their pre-season or their official start of the pre-season so they don't have to pay them. And your contract is up the second the season finishes. What do you do for the three months in between? You go, go on the dole, presumably, an awful lot of players. Has there been progress as part of this that yes. players have to be paid for the full 52 weeks of yeah, the year? Yeah, we're getting there, Nathan. So we're now, we're now down to four weeks. So we get players paid November 30th. Preseason starts first week in January, so we've got the week of month of December. The gap has gone so close that a lot of clubs now are actually just saying, "Well, look, for the sake of four weeks, we'll actually pay them that extra four weeks." So we're 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 getting there. We're the squeezes. We're squeezing it tighter and tighter and tighter. So yeah, if you're on a one year deal, um, your contract runs out, you sign another contract, and it starts on the fourth of January. There is that month, but we're getting there. Um, we're only like as you said, it was three months at one stage. It's closing up now. Uh, to play a devil's advocate in this because I, you know, I think it's very hard for people to make a case that players shouldn't be paid €430 Euro per week. Mm. Do you see there being a reduction in the amount of full-time professional players within the league because of this? So if you're a Bohemians, for example, and you have players who are on €300 Euro a week who are 17, 18, 19, good talents, but yeah. we know in football, an injury, and there's no guarantee they're going to move on to England, the club will ever make money off them or that they'll ever become first-team players. Yeah. But you want to give them a chance of being a full-time professional to see how they progress. That now, instead of having 10 of those players mm. at 18, 19, you go, well, we can only afford to five of them. And then five players are stuck on €130 Euro a week or going back being amateur or just falling out of the game completely. Yeah, it, it, look, it, it, the economics of this will work itself out. What I do see and where I see the advantage of it is that I'm aware of players who are paid, full-time professional players, at, at one of our top five clubs this year, a number of them on 200 quid a week, full-time, right? Um, the minimum wages come in, the club has decided now that they can't afford 430, so they're going to let them go. If they were still on 220, they would be retained by the club and kept there again and probably not playing the games again. So there's an advantage to the 430, you know, because mm. the 430 now means that the retention won't happen because they can't, they're looking at the player and going, 200, I'd keep him because he might do something down the line, we might throw him in for the odd game. But now it's 430. Now that decision now is that we're gonna we, we have to move him out. What that then opens up is an opportunity then for him to go to another club. Now the next club looks at him and goes, okay, young player coming out, looks good, he's maybe played eight, nine, ten games in the first first time, but he's costing us 430. But the difference is he's no training compensation on him, so he's a free agent. So so there's a give and take in all these moves. Uh, we do need to take a quick break. Uh, Stephen McGuinness, the General Secretary of the PFAI, is in studio with us. All our football coverage is brought to you by Sky. You can watch all the football you love, including the biggest Premier League games every weekend live on Sky. There's uh, plenty more I want to talk to you about what's going on in the PFAI at the moment as well around the women's game. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Back in a moment. Sky. Don't miss Wolves versus Arsenal on Saturday Night Football. Live only on Sky Sports. This is News Talk. Football on Off the Ball. With Sky. Watch Newcastle versus Chelsea on Saturday Night Football. Live only on Sky Sports. This is News Talk. All right, you're very welcome back to the football show. Nathan, with you this evening. I've been joined in the studio by Stephen McGuinness, the General Secretary of the Players Football Association of Ireland. We've been talking about the new minimum wage for senior professionals, uh, €430 Euro per week for full-time professionals, €130 Euro per week uh, for part-time professionals. Have you had much feedback? Uh, loads. <laughs> yeah, it's been incredible the last couple of days, I have to say. Um, very positive. I spoke to actually Stephen Kenny this morning around it. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been really positive. Um, and I suppose 
we're building relationships with the with the FAO. I have to say, uh, the relationship is building. Uh, it's not quite there yet, obviously, but um, they have played. Mark Scanlon uh, played a key role in it. To be honest, he would have been the buffer between ourselves and the clubs, um, and would have done a hell of a lot of work to try and get the, to get this deal over the line. I must recognise Joe O'Brien from the board of the FAO as well, who was who was on the NLC, and Dermot Hearn, who chairs uh, the NLC, um, and all would have helped on the Premier Division side of things. I, I felt that. Daniel Lambert and uh, Anthony Delaney, um, who was the secretary and, and the chair of it, were, were excellent to deal with. I have to say, um, so that, that that there's a real there's a real feel, and I get a feel that people want to push the game on. When you see uh, us looking on somebody giving you more than what you're looking for, there's always that feel that you know we are actually making progress here. And uh, and you you've got to give credit to people because sometimes we criticise at times the FEI for certain things. In this case. Uh, although it took longer than I would have liked um, and we're not happy with the part-time side of things I do think that Mark Scanlon uh, his role in it he played a, a key role in, in getting it to, to where we got to he, he, I know he's a lot he's trying to keep everybody happy it's a very difficult thing to do but I did feel that he played uh, played a key role in it uh, What's your sense of where the league is now as the head of the players body because mm. On one side, it does feel like there's progress and there's a lot of interest in the league. Uh, yet at the same time, the league has just lost almost all its best young talent in yeah, yeah. one transfer window from all of the top teams, yeah. uh, all going across for very little money, it felt, an awful lot of the time. You've been around the league for, for decades uh, uh, as a player and as a representative. W- what's your feeling as to how the League of Ireland is, how healthy it is? Yeah, I, I suppose, Nathan, the one thing I judge on is how many... Um, how many players at the end of every season are owed wages? We've now, I think this is nearly season five with no That's issues. Really depressing, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. The judge <laughs> of how the league is going is how many players are getting their wages on time. And and we've now probably gone four to five years now with it really steady. And that's a that's a from where we were to where we that is a real positive uh, licensing, which was uh, which wasn't working. It worked for us, but wasn't working for for other people within the game. Um, has got better. It's got better teeth. It needs to still do a little bit more for me. But it's better. I think the get the game is in a, is in um, is in better shape. I think there's better people running the club, running it for the right reasons. Um, and I I think in general in general things are really really good. The point you make about the transfer of players, our clubs have to be stronger. We've got to get ourselves in a stronger position. I think I know some people I I think it was Daniel Lambert had put out last year that look we have to look, agree into these clauses that are in contracts is really with, with players where they're capping how much a club can look for is is they, I know I had conversations with the clubs where, where we were going again we have to build relationships here but that us in the clubs was to town and put something in that would protect um, the, the, the industry by saying that you know you can't actually cap what a club or what a what a, a club come from the outside in to take your player can look for you know because I think we're aware of certain moves that happened this year and there was a certain amount of money that, that uh, would trigger the player's release mm quite low them numbers are so we we have to get ourselves in a stronger position on how we deal with agents I think I think agents have become um, very much part of our game and the agents are if you can kick a ball straight male or female now has an agent like it has, it has been an incredible last three or four years and how are you player. approaching that as the players organisation well, because I know a lot of people around the league would have a lot of questions about the, a lot of the agents who have come in over the last yeah, year and, and whether they have the best interests of the players at heart I agree with you and um, this year we're looking to have four new uh, advisory seminars around the country where we're trying to advise parents and young players because they are they're not signing players up when they're 23, 24 they're signing up when they're 15 and 16 so we need to get in before that and what we're trying to do as well is educate the players before they become professionals or what you're actually getting involved with so that's our plan this year Nathan is to go around the country for different seminars to start talking about the issues that players and agents is one of them and we have to advise there's this new thank God there's an exam coming in so that should filter out a, a good bit uh, of the, the bad ones uh, but there's I would have on a regular day five, six agents ring me asking questions because they don't know the rules about training compensation about you know what's the what, what sort of wage should I be looking for uh, them saying is the minimum wage coming in do I hang up in a couple of weeks don't want to negotiate a deal here that's going to be less than the minimum wage but they're everywhere night and and it's a real problem for, for the game and it's something that the FEI like I would say to you that and this is from the contracts I've seen I would say to you that there's 95% of players in this league has an agent and 95% of the contracts don't have the agent's name on them when they sign and I don't know why that is um, 
like there seems to be this under undercurrent of agents working but not doing it legitimately and I think it's something the FA have got to get their hands on and, and make sure that uh, it's it just needs to be scrutinised more and we need to sit on it a little bit better and advise players uh, to, what to look out for. Well, looking from your position and let's not name names, but looking at the moves that happened uh, in mid-season, yeah. how many of them would you say were good moves for the player? Were there many of those you would have said actually the best deal, the best thing for your career would have been to mm. stay in the League of Ireland? Yeah, uh, I, I, I would say that a lot of the moves, the player was probably at the right time to go. I, I would say in a lot of the moves um, the player was at the right time to go the choice of club you can question but I do think there's a point where when a, when a, an Irish player has played in the league and has gone and played in Europe and done well in European games I think he shows he can play at a level beyond their own league and I think that's when the trigger for, for most fellas is to go I think a lot of English clubs wait to see them play in Europe so if you look at Dawson Devoy as an example or Ross Tierney they're, they're playing or Georgie Kelly they're playing in Europe they're, they're playing at, at a really high level and they've shown that they can play so I think them going is fine. I think, Nathan, one of the issues that I have about young players is we felt that sending them to England was it was, uh, was not the right thing to do. They were too young. And, was, and I'm watching players on the radar here going to Germany, going to Italy, going to Belgium, and going, if it wasn't right to send them to England where they actually speak the language and it's an hour's flight and whatever, and yeah, we're happy to send them beyond that. That's something that I'm not comfortable with, I have to be honest. I guess the numbers aren't as big that are going No, but it's still play- those it, countries. Yeah, and it doesn't matter numbers, it's people. These are human beings, like, and we're not putting any protection in. We're sending them, and there's players, in, and you know them like I do. And um, just it doesn't sit well with me. I have to say, it doesn't. I, I think Brexit's been really positive for us. I think it's really positive. I think the majority of our players have stayed here, and they're and they're more equipped going at 18, 19. Like you like looks at like Josh Keeley who went to Spurs. Um, He's a more mature man when he goes. Look at Harrington at, at, at Cork. Far more mature play than forced him. Well able to to handle, you would think, handle uh, life in, in a professional. Instead of going as a scholar at 15 or 16 and you're, you know, you're, you're trying to get through the academy type of stuff, it's really difficult. Um, they're far better at home in their own beds. They're far better being educated here. So um, that, has, that has been positive. I'm just a little bit concerned about the players that are going beyond, um, beyond the UK now at an earlier age of 16. Uh, something that was brought up to me by a couple of people at different clubs was the cost of living crisis for the mm. clubs in Dublin, uh, where so many of the Premier League clubs, Premier Division clubs are based at the moment. How are your members dealing with the cost of living crisis within the League of Ireland? Where, you know, if a player is on 1,500 quid a week in the League of Ireland, people think it's insane money and they're living the high life. And I know 1,500 quid a week for a young lad in his early mm. 20s is, is very good money. Uh, but, you know, at 430 euro a week. There's not yeah. many players actually who'd be able to afford to live in Dublin on that sort of money. No, majority of our players now, if you're being honest, are living at home. Like, so there's nobody on 430 quid going out and buying a house or you know mm. getting a mortgage or, or doing doing anything like that. The reality on, on players in our league is they're playing in our league to get a move. That's the reality of it. Every player here is playing here to get a move to a, to a bigger league. That's the reality. You're not going to become rich. Hopefully, you can break into a first team where your wages incrementally go up. Um, th- we obviously are actively encouraging the players to have dual careers so that to ensure that when that time comes and that decision comes in, in life that you, you now want to buy a house, you now want to get a car loan or whatever, that you have that dual career. And I, I know keep, people keep harping on, but it is only the minimum, Nathan. Like, I've got to be honest, there's lots of, play, like it, there's lots of players who are, who are on significantly more than that, and rightfully so too. Um, so the, 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 the 20-year-old who's on that money is definitely somebody who's either in, uh, who's in education and playing full-time football and still living at home. Uh, probably the PFAI's. I don't know if you'd say it was its greatest day, but certainly the day that comes up most often was the day in Liberty Hall yeah. with the women's team and the stand that was taken. And when qualification was assured for the World Cup, it come up countless times over the following days mm. how important it was. What happened? Uh, what is the PFAI's current relationship with the women's game? Because there's a mm. lot of talk at the moment and speculation. I see Heather O'Reilly saying like, does, you know, embrace this opportunity to help the women's national league progress. Um, going semi-professional there. What's the PFA, PFAI's involvement there? Yeah, so, um, first of all, you're, you're right. In, in July 20, or it was April 3, 2017, it was a, a massive stand. And I think you've got to recognise Stuart Gilhooley, Simone Flannery and uh, Ollie Cahill, who, who played key roles in, in, in getting that, that in. Um, I think since then, um, the things have improved 
for the women's seniors national team because of the investment that ultimately went in. And I think the investment went in when they when they were having to fund the players, they were saying, well, look, if we're funding them to this level, should we may as well go the other little bit to give them them little bit extras. And I, I know me and you were chatting off air about how much better it is. Like, we have people who go out now and do recce before the team gets there. So Finland were here. I was, at a conf- I was on a call the other week and the Finnish uh, Players uh, so, or the, yeah, the Finnish Players Association plus the Finnish player were complaining about the facilities in Ireland, saying it was really poor and, and where they were training wasn't great. But then when I, when I checked it out, they didn't send anybody over to Ireland. They had to have a look at the facilities. But now the air preparation is almost better. If one of the issues that we had in, in 2017 with the girls was there was no Wi-Fi in the hotels, so now all that stuff started because we go out beforehand and make sure that everything is done. So what you're saying is ahead of the Finland game we pulled a fast one. They didn't send anyone <laughs> over and we just stuck them in uh, whatever training pitch we could. Correct, and that's what would have been happened. To, that would have been happening in source, but also it worked. So it works, why not? But that would have been something that would have happened to us for years because we right. didn't resource it right. So we have uh, Evelyn who works for the FU, does a brilliant job. Like, she only out in Australia last week to check out the facilities in Australia. So so. That it's be, the team behind the team is so important, and that's where the women's team has been successful. Um, on the domestic front, I was with Abby Larkin and her dad in with government uh, two weeks ago um, to talk about centralised contracts. And now Aidan O'Reardon has done a huge amount of work in it, and there's other people involved looking at centralised contracts. Cause I think that is probably the way the women's game has to go. I, I still think there's a fear there with the clubs because it's not just 139, it's everything that goes around that. There's insurance, there's physios, there's doctors, there's all this other stuff that comes around. And there's no revenue. Coming correct. In. Correct. So, so that is there in the same scenario as the men's game where there's I know the games are in TG Cahar but mm. I can't imagine there's much revenue coming in from a TV rights deal yep. uh, the attendances still are very small so there's yeah. far less coming in than the men's game and while sponsorship you would imagine will uh, go up over the coming year mm. how do the clubs actually pay for this yeah no it, and it, it is really that's where I think governments have to look at this now and go okay how can we assist the game to grow because when I start representing the team back in 2015 when I met him born first it was um, the, the split was a seven Seventy percent of the players were were home based and thirty percent were abroad. It's now ninety five percent abroad mm. and five percent on your government is probably the only one regularly in the team. That and are all those members of the PFAI? Yeah, so uh, so all the all the players will be members of our association. But I have to be honest, as they relate, as they have grown as a group. They just need us to have their to, to be there to support them. They're more than capable, and they always were. And we would always encourage our players to negotiate themselves. Don't need us to negotiate every single thing. Um, and they're at a point. Uh, Kate is at a point now where they're comfortable to negotiate uh, themselves. But they always know that we ha- we, so we they know their own value. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the, sorry. Go back to the, the domestic game here. The only way Nathan I see it is government, and we have centralised company similar to the to the rugby, similar to the women's in the rugby, and it is interesting where they've struggled to get girls to to take up them contracts. And I'm I'm not suggesting there's a difference between well, rugby and, and soccer. There is a difference because you have to go through a college system and that you don't have them football. So I would say that if you are offering uh, them types of contracts uh, in the women's game, I think you'd have a lot more players taking them up. Um, I do see that model potent- it will happen when I don't know but it will happen uh, and I think 30 players in centralised contracts with a 10 team league with 3 players from each playing in each team is I'd love to see it I'd love to see it in Abbottstown players training full time um, and giving them that platform to be uh, professional players and to increase obviously from an international perspective uh, make our international team better So, um, Part of uh, the issue with all this is obviously money and it all comes back to money and getting revenue into the game and I'm still shocked by how far behind it feels that that sort of financial ecosystem is around even the League of Ireland that more more companies aren't realising how grassroots it is that, that yeah. connection you can make that seems to be there with say the GEA and, and the rugby I'm going to ask you now because you spent so long uh, out sitting alongside uh, John Delaney and uh, I used to mm. meet you out in the FAI and it was these bizarre scenarios I remember interviewing John Delaney out there one day at uh, about the League of Ireland I think it was one of your last crises uh, alongside yep. John Delaney was it Limerick players who weren't being was paid it? at the yeah. time it was it. and uh, interviewing John Delaney in the FAI boardroom and then running around to literally the back garden of the FAI and interviewing you straight afterwards to get your reaction back in but you would never talk to each other no uh, how's the relationship now with the FAI? Um, it's it's building. I think it's building. Um, it's um, it's a lot more collaborative. Um, we 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 speak a lot more. There's a more structure in in regards to to conversations. There's still there's probably still trust issues there that we're still not not there yet. I don't think uh, there's a lot happened, Nathan, and it's very hard to let what went on what, before. What are the trust issues? I would say that um, there's still. There's probably a still feeling from our organisation that the players still don't have the platform that we want and we would like. 
within the game, everybody has a, a platform to bring their issues forward. We don't. So, but so is that not your job? So it Are is, you not in the room when the decisions have been made? Certainly no. No is the answer to that. And also on top of that, we don't have a player status committee, which, w- which we fought for for now two and a half years. We're hopefully only four weeks away from announcing it, where we have a situation where male and female players can bring their issues forward, whatever they may be. There was never a platform for that before. So there was nowhere for us to go by banging the door of the FAI with a begging bowl saying, please, will you listen to the problems we've got? Now, a player stats committee, which is linked into the NLC, that's where the, 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 the game needs to go from the player's perspective. Because wh- whether the issues are, like what we said, uh, we we're ch- chatting over here, the Dirty City player who was sent off the other day, um, who now goes and lobbies and says, here, from now on, if you get sent off in a, in a league game, you can't miss the FAI Cup final because of that. You should miss the first game in the following season. Who lobby? Where, where, where do you bring that? Who do you go to with that? Like, if you have a player status committee who sees that as a concern... Or see is that instead of five yellow cards, it should be six yellow cards because we're missing uh, uh, our game or we're missing games cards or an issue with their contracts. Where do they go to? Like, so, so a player stats can be so important from our perspective that hasn't been there for a hundred years at the FAI. Like, don't forget, it's only a couple of years. Sorry, it's only three years since we've been on um, on the General Assembly. The, the defence forces were on the General Assembly for fifty years. Like the G- defence forces, with all due respect, are are a body who who play a couple of games a year. The professional players had no voice. So to suggest now that after all that, that we're all now going to work hand in hand, it, it, it takes time and it takes time to trust people as well that they are listening. Um, and the FAI are doing a lot of talking at the moment, lots of consultation. I'd like to see a little bit more action. Are, are you still based in Abbottstown? Well, you know, we're, yeah. still based. So I, we're still there. I, I think uh, to describe your relationship with John Delaney as Techie will be the understatement of the century. And mm-hmm. there was always feeling, even though you were uh, along the same corridor, your offices, you would never knock on it. No. Would you, would you feel comfortable knocking on Jonathan Hill's door? Um, what does feel? It's um, I, I do, you, do you feel you'd be listened to? Um, I, no, I do. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I do. Sorry for, for pausing there for a second because uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to contrast the two men, which is quite difficult to do. Um, the yeah, I, I, I would. Um, I do find that with Mark Scanlon as the league director, I do find that 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 portal to talk to him is there and, and it works. Um, what had happened, as you know, before was the previous CEO, who I just don't like saying his name, um, you were told you couldn't speak to him. So you were getting messages from Frank Gavin saying, you have to deal with me. That isn't the way. If I want to contact Jonathan Hill, I will contact Jonathan Hill, and he will respond to you. Mm. So, so at least that you may not get the answer you want, but, but, it's but at least, yeah. Where before, as you well know, it was uh, sorry, I'm not taking that, talking to you. Who are you to speak to me? You need to go go to there. So that that has changed. And look, at Roy Barrett is very good to chair the board, and you do have access to people now. And if you do have genuine issues, you do have access to people to be able to bring them issues forward. With the player status committee donating, so important. And for men's and women's football, when that's set up, I think it's key for the future of the game for for, for players. Uh, maybe just go full circle as to who the PFAI are, and because uh, I know you've been on the show a lot and you've uh, been talking about issues quite a bit. Who are your membership aside from League of Ireland players? Yeah, so obviously the international, the international men and the international women, um, and again that relationship. I know, yeah, so this doesn't get said enough, right? Robbie Kane was key to everything when I took the association over uh, fifteen years ago from Frank Gavin. Robbie was was absolutely key to it, and he doesn't get the credit for in it. Way. In in that the the revenues for the association comes from the image rights, and um, Robbie when I sat down with himself and it was Shay Given to talk about what we wanted to do as an association and the services that we wanted to put in for the players and how important we felt that, that it was that the players had a proper voice within Irish football. Um, we needed the international players to sign over as members of ours so we could we could use the image rights to be able to bring revenues in to be able to offer these services to our members. What do you mean by image rights? So, so, so for example, in the games, so in FIFA, for example, so the FEI would would obviously have the jersey, would have the the crest, but the image of the player, so his face um, on the computer be, game FIFA. On the computer game FIFA, okay. exactly. So the way it works is FIFA then, basically FIFA uh, take in all the collective rights. And then the so FIFA, FIFA or the at the world like FIFA, and what they do then is they distribute them out to all the countries based on your ranking spoken in your league and in your international team in September so uh, so but is it's that a good earner? 
it's enough to be able to to, to run an office, and it's enough to it's, right. it's enough to be able to uh, it's enough for us to be able to offer the service that we can, whether that's in mental health, whether that's in in education. And um, so, yeah, no, it, it is good, and it's it's look, it was key, and Robbie doesn't get the credit for it that he deserves because he was brilliant. I have to say, now Seamus, if I ever needed anything, and Seamus would absolutely take a call and he'd listen to any issues there. Was, but Robbie was the key for us to be able to grow the association to where it is today. And without him, I have to say, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be where we are without without. And in terms of representing the senior international men's players, they obviously all have their own agents as well. Yeah. What form does that take on? Yeah, they have Kieran Medler, who who does their uh, their stuff here. Um, so, so if they were to qualify for a major tournament, they'd exactly. be helping with the negotiations, exactly. and bonuses. So, so Kieran Medler does all that stuff. I've had conversations with Kieran and with Seamus um, where on the qualification there would be assistance given to some of the programmes that we run. And that's, that's, that's fantastic and we were delighted with that. Again, let's see what happens in the, in the future but the, rela- the relationship is, is one where if we needed them they would always be there for you uh, Just to wrap up then uh, if uh, that door that Jonathan Hill was uh, sitting in or even Mark Scanlon was sitting in and you were put in charge of the League of Ireland what would you change? Um, well what we've got to do and I know it looks easy for people to say from the outside but there has to be a TV deal cut somewhere we have to it, it, it's just a given um, I, I do think government and, and um, Jack Chambers is at our awards um, on Saturday week he's speaking on it and it'll be interesting to see what he's got to say um, I do think government have neglected uh, professional football in this country um, I think the facilities are something that if I was somebody in in, the, in that ministry, I'd be looking at and saying, how can we assist the federation? How can we assist our clubs to get better facilities? Like some of them are toward world and they need to be better. So that's that something... part of the FAI strategy as well. It, it absolutely is. And, and I do think the doors are opening. Uh, I do think government are listening. Um, I, I'm delighted that Jack is coming to our awards uh, on Saturday. And, and we look forward to what he's got to say uh, on, on some of these key issues. I see Alan Manis is nominated for Player of the Year in the PFA Awards, so the the whole thing's a disrepute already. Yeah, well, it's the Team of the Year. Nathan comes out uh, comes out tomorrow, so I think he might even be more disappointed. Wow! All right, uh, Stephen, always a pleasure. Thanks a lot for coming Thanks in. Thanks, Nathan. Football on off the ball with Sky. Don't miss Wolves versus Arsenal on Saturday Night Football live only on Sky Sports. This is News Talk.